Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Thank you very much. Oh, it's a blessing to be back with you. Like Dwayne said, I've been coming here for 34 years. He was a young man back then. I remember going running with him one time, and I ran eight miles, and it like to have killed me. And we got back, and he says, I'm going to go a little further, and I think he went another 10 miles or something. That guy's an animal. But what a blessing to be here. And I was telling uh, Dwayne and Bernie back there that it's just such a blessing to see what God has done with Res Life. I was here and seen a lot of growth and to just see them still loving the Lord and loving the same wife. Man, that's awesome. You guys are blessed. I don't think you know how blessed you are. Sometimes we take things for granted, but it's just such an honor to see them still doing the same thing and just plugging along. And that's, that's what happens. We have these people come along that are real flashy sometimes and they get all of the attention, but it's the ones that just keep doing the same thing day after day that really see the results. And so it's an honor to be associated with them. Let me mention real quickly that we do have two schools here in this area, one over in Ann Arbor and one here in Grand Rapids, Karis Bible College. And we've got the directors of those two schools here, or they were here in the first service. Are you all here? Stand up if you're around. Here's somebody with the light up here in the balcony. Are both of you up there? Anyway, I think we have a table out here someplace. If you're interested in a Bible college, this is really awesome. We have about 8,000 students worldwide in, uh, uh, I forget how many countries, but 70 different Bible schools outside of the United States. And so anyway, please go check it out. And we have uh, eCaris that you could also take that is all online. And uh, it's, we've got, I think the, Bernie said there was four or five of the staff here that are doing that. And so it's really good. It's the best thing. If I wasn't in full-time ministry, I'd be at Caris Bible College. <laughs> it's awesome. So anyway, that's great. For those of you that were not at the first service, I used uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. And that says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I, ta I was teaching on the balance between grace and faith. If you missed that, I'm going to continue kind of what I taught in the first service. I know that that's some of you that didn't hear it. That may uh, put you at a disadvantage, but you can go to my website and get the teaching. It's all free. I've got a book on this, DVDs and stuff entitled Living in the Balance of grace and faith. And real, I hate to even say real quickly, because if I try and summarize what I said, I'll re-preach it. But uh, real quickly, uh, basically I was saying that grace is God's part, faith is our part, and there's misunderstanding. Some people think faith is what we do to get God to move. No, God moves independent of you prior to you even existing prior to you even having a need, everything that you receive from God comes through Jesus, and he came 2,000 years ago and did everything. It's finished. Jesus doesn't have to do anything. He's seated at the Father's right hand. Faith doesn't move God. Faith only reaches out and appropriates what God has already given. If it's already given, then that means that there is no burden upon you to do something to get God to move. Now, that's a quick summary of what I said, but I, that's powerful, and that really goes contrary to what most people live. Most people are, they know that God is all-powerful, that He can do anything. They just don't believe He has done anything. They believe He will only move in response to us, and that is completely wrong. Our faith should be in response to Him, not Him responding to us. And you can tell, this is an oversimplification, but I don't mean this critical, but if you think that God is responding to you in what you're doing, you're religious. Amen. <laughs> I know that could be taken really badly. Uh, Dwayne's going to clean all of this up when I'm gone. <laughs> that could really offend some people, but it's true. 
Religion teaches you've got to do this in order to God, get God to do this. True Christianity is not what you do for God. It's what he did for you already by grace. And you're just responding to what he's already done. And if that isn't clear to you, well, then you're religious. That means that you are, it's man-made. It's not God-made. God is him reaching down to us. Religion is man reaching up to God. So anyway, I talked about all of those things. Over here in Hebrews chapter 4, I'm going to talk to you about the rest of God. And this is kind of an illustration uh, how you can tell whether you are responding to God's grace or whether you are trying to get God to respond to you. Those are two separate things. They're diametrically opposed to each other. One of them produces victory and joy and peace in your life. The other one will wear you out. Amen. I was raised in the Baptist church that taught that, you know, you got saved, and then after you got saved that you couldn't get healed, you couldn't do anything else. You just had to work for God, do a work for God, and it was all about being a human doing instead of a human being. And we had this little... Um, uh, poem that we used to give that said, you know, Mary had a little lamb. It would have been a sheep, but it joined the Baptist church and died from lack of sleep. <laughs> and it was just all doing something for God. And I thought that, you know, my, my dad died when I was 12 years old and I had fasted when I was 11 and prayed for him. He was in the hospital for months and I was doing all of these things. And when he died, I just couldn't understand. God, I've done all of these things. Why didn't you heal my dad? And it's frustrating. And this is why a lot of people turn away from the Lord, because they believe that God exists. They believe he can do anything, but they think they have to do something to make God move. And this is why they get into doing so much. And they study the word thinking, God, did you see what I've done? that's not the reason you study the Word, is to have God reward you for reading the Word or going to church or paying your tithes. And yet, if you aren't careful, you'll fall into this because this is what religion teaches. Religion is teaching basically that God exists, but man, you've got to do all of these things and jump through these hoops in order to get God to move in your life. And I tell you, that'll wear you out. And I've been in ministry now for 52 years and I've seen people come and go, and I think that probably the number one thing that causes burnout in people is the fact that they are trying to make God do all this. They're trying to live up to this standard and do these things, and it just wears you out. And there's a lot of people that have quit. They still believe in God. They believe He exists. They just believe that, man, there's no way I'm ever going to meet all of the standards. I might as well just quit trying. <laughs> Amen. So there is a rest for the people of God. Look at these verses in Hebrews chapter 4. It says in verse 1, Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. And if you read this in context, the third chapter was talking about the children of Israel that came out of the land of Egypt. And uh, they came out of bondage, but they didn't enter into the promised land that God had promised for them. And that entire generation died short of what God wanted them to be. And brothers and sisters, I say this with no joy whatsoever, but the majority of Christians, and I know that this is probably not just your typical church, but I would dare to say that even a lot of people that are right here, you aren't enjoying the fullness of what God has for you. You've come out of being lost, if you were to die, you'd go to be with the Lord, but you aren't enjoying the benefits, the fullness of what God has. That's terrible. It's terrible that we aren't partaking of everything. Jesus purchased healing for us. Man, we should be walking in healing. We should be walking in prosperity. We should be walking in joy. We should be walking in peace. We shouldn't be terrified the way that other people are. And yet there's a lot of Christians that if you were arrested for being a Christian, there wouldn't be enough evidence in your life to convict you. I mean, you're as sick as your neighbor that doesn't know the Lord. You're as poor. You're as worried. You're looking at things that are happening at the riots and you're panicking. You're, you're just as bothered as anybody else. You're like the Israelites that came out of Egypt, but you're dying in the wilderness. You aren't entering into what God has for you. And it says... Let us fear lest that happens to us because 
unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that hear it. This is not just magic. It's not like, you know, I've actually seen people when we're casting demons out and somebody goes to manifesting demons. I've had people before hold a Bible up like this. It kind of reminds me of the, uh, uh, what do they call those? The uh, Yeah, vampires. Thank you. I, you watch those things, don't you? <laughs> It reminds me of those vampire movies where they hold a cross up or something and they just can't stand it. That's silly. First place, vampires are silly. But if there were vampires holding a cross or a Bible up, it's not, you know, the devil translated some of these Bibles. The Bible by itself doesn't scare people. The Bible says of itself right here in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, that the Word of God is quick. That means alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The true Word of God is a spiritual thing. This Bible represents it, and I believe it represents it perfectly, but this isn't the Bible. This is the representation. The Bible is alive. It's real. And you've got to make it a part of you. And the way you do that is when you mix these words with faith, when it becomes real on the inside of you is when it takes on this life. And so it says you have to mix it with faith. And then in verse 3, it says, For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath. This is a quotation from Psalms chapter 95, verse 11. And anyway, the wording here in the King James is really awkward. This is one of the most uh, awkward King James translations in the Bible, and I don't have another translation with me right now. So I'm going to summarize some of this to you. But when he's talking here about rest, he's not talking about that. Well, let me just go on and read just a little bit more. It says uh, in verse 3, For we, we which believe do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if, I shall in, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of, of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from his works. So he's likening this rest that he's talking about to the Sabbath rest that God took at creation. And you've got to change your thinking here because most of us, when we talk about rest, you're talking about being tired and you go lay down and rest. But when it says that God rested, this is a quotation from uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 1, that he rested from all of his works and he blessed or hallowed the Sabbath day because he rested. When he rested, it wasn't because he was tired. God wasn't worn out. It says in Isaiah chapter 40 that the Lord doesn't get weary. God wasn't worn out. It's not like if he made one more star, he was just done for the day. He was, <laughs> he was totally give out. That's not what this is talking about. When it says that he rested, it's like when an artist paints a picture and everything is so perfect that if you add one more brush stroke to that, you're going to ruin the whole thing. And so you put the the paintbrush now, not because the paintbrush is heavy, but you're resting from your work because it's finished. It's complete. Or a, a lawyer will say, I rest my case. It's not because he's so tired that I just, I rest. I, I can't share anymore. No, it means that he's shared everything that there is to share. And so he's through, he's complete. The, when Jesus rested from his work that he had made, it wasn't because he was tired. It was because it was complete. And I'm going to say some things here about creation and just hold with me because I'm going to apply it to you. And there is a direct comparison. That's what he's doing. He says there is a rest for the people of God. And then he starts talking about this rest that God took. So for you to understand the rest that is available to us, you need to understand how God rested. And so again, just for time's sake here, we're limited. I'm just going to summarize some things. But you go back to Genesis and you study Genesis chapter 1, and it is very specific the way the Lord created everything. He didn't just say, let there be trees, let there be grass, let there be cattle, let there be animals, let there be fish in the sea. See, he could have done that, 
But if he would have done it that way, he would have had to have recreated animals, fish, and trees, and grass after the fall entered in and people died. He would have had to have created new things. But if you go back and read in the book of Genesis, it's very specific. He says, let the earth bring forth the tree whose seed is in itself. And everything he created, let the earth bring forth grass whose seed is in itself. Let the uh, earth bring forth animals and, and let the, uh, whose seed is in itself. And he kept talking about this. Everything he created, he created it so perfectly that he has never created anything since. He didn't wake up this morning and create a million new cows to replace all the ones that we <laughs> ate. Did you know that the Lord has never created another tree? God has never created another blade of grass. He's never created another animal. He anticipated, even though he created this not to us, not to sin, he anticipated that we would sin. The scripture says he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He knew that there would be sin. He knew that eventually death would come into this world that he created. And so he created in every animal, in every living plant, in all of the fish and in people, the ability to procreate. He anticipated all of this, and God hasn't done anything about creation since the original creation. That is significant. Most people don't think about this, but it's really important. And I hadn't got time to go into this, and I mentioned this briefly in the first service, and uh, I'm going to open up a whole can of worms here that I haven't got time to explain, but... Pastor Dwayne will straighten all this out when I'm gone. But that's the reason I disagree with this humanistic thing that, that we're destroying our planet, that we're exploiting our planet, that we are gonna, we're going to use up all the resources of our planet. God thought through all of these things. Did you know he created enough, he created enough food on this planet to feed right now 7 billion people? And if we grow to 14 billion people, there will still be enough. He's anticipated anything that we can do, and God made this world to last. I was just reading this last week that he says that he's established the earth to last forever. Now, he's going he's gonna to destroy and create a new heaven and a new earth, but this earth is never going to run out of stuff. Uh, you know, people are talking about we could run out of fossil fuels. I've got a guy that works for me that has built an engine that runs on water. He's, run, he's driven a car 100,000 miles. He's in the process of, of working that thing out. Water can power everything we're doing. There's no limit. God has created everything. The only limit is us and us just not using the resources properly. So anyway, my point in saying all of this is that God thought through creation Nothing is taking him by surprise. He doesn't have to get up and say, well, man, they're eating all of the animals. I got to create new animals. No, he created in the animals the ability to procreate. And did you know, I, I read in a magazine that there's one stand of trees in Iceland, that that one stand of trees alone is enough to purify the air of the entire world, this one stand of trees. And that's not even including the, you know, the South American rainforest. I've got a friend that works in the Forest Service. And did you know that there's twice as many trees in the United States today as there was when the pilgrims arrived? God made things to replenish and stuff. He, when he created, he rested because there was nothing left to do. I mean, there was absolutely nothing. And this is just andeology, but I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. And I believe that God might have spent eons, millions of years, thinking through creation and anticipating everything that could possibly happen. And then when he created, it only took six days to create the entire universe and everything, but it had a huge amount of thought going into it. If you look at things on the molecular uh, man, I could just, I spend a lot of time thinking about these things. But I was flying here on an airplane on Friday and looking at the air and uh, clouds and thinking clouds are awesome. How did God think up all of this stuff? We don't think about it, but it's miraculous. 
And that plane was flying. It looks like it was flying through nothing. But did you know air? There's all kinds of stuff in here. It looks like there's nothing in between me and you, but there's air. Air is real. And yet we don't see it. We don't take it. For, but God thought through all this. And that plane was just, it was, uh, it was because there is air that that plane was able to fly. Anyway, my point is God is just awesome. He thought through all of this stuff. He thought through creation so well that he even anticipated all of the things that could happen through a fallen world, and he created this earth. And when he rested, it was because it was complete. There is nothing left to do. God doesn't have to, uh, you know, respond to us and, oh, we're going to deplete the planet and we're going to do this. He's anticipated anything we could ever do to mess things up in this world will fix itself. Some of you don't agree with that, and you're entitled to your opinion, but I'm not going to agree with you or we'd both be wrong. So he rested on the seventh day, and it, and it talks about these Old Testament prophecies and says when he rested, that rest wasn't fulfilled when Joshua brought the children of Israel into the promised land because hundreds of years after that, David said in Psalms chapter 95 verse 11, that there is still a rest for the people of God. And so he comes down here and he says uh, in verse 9, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God that wasn't fulfilled in type and shadow with Joshua bringing the children of Israel into the promised land. And then he says in verse 10, for he that is entered into his rest, into God's rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. And so what this is talking about is that God rested because everything was complete. He never has created another thing. He's never done anything new with creation. He rested. It's complete. The only other creation God has ever made is the new creation. You and me, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature or some translations say a new, trans, a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. And here's the application to you, is that just like God created this earth so complete that it self-perpetuates um, itself. Everything was created, everything that we'll ever need. Did you know all of the steel that's in this building? Did you know God anticipated that we would use steel and stuff? And he put in rocks, all of these things, and gave us the knowledge to get it out. And there is knowledge... I heard Oral Roberts one time say that a, a regular slice of white bread has enough power in those atoms that if you could split those atoms in a one slice of white bread, it's enough power to power an ocean liner across the ocean and back. But we can't split those atoms. We can only split unstable atoms like plutonium and uranium and stuff like this. But God has created this universe, has everything that we'll ever need. God has never had to do anything else. Whatever the needs of mankind are, He already anticipated it. It's in creation, and all we've got to do is just figure it out and unlock it and go to using it. Did you know that this wireless microphone we're using, these laws have been in effect since God created things. People didn't know it, so they didn't use it. The air conditioning that we're using, these laws have been here. Did you know electricity has been here since God created the heavens and the earth? He didn't just create electricity a couple of hundred years ago. People are just <laughs> learning these things. But the laws have been here all along. And likewise, when you get born again, God made you a new creation. And just like the original creation, He made you complete. Your spirit is as perfect and complete right this moment as it will ever be in eternity. Thank you for those two amens. <laughs> most people are thinking, no, that's not true. And that's because we, most of us, don't walk in the Spirit. Most of us go by what we see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. Most of us, that's what the Bible calls carnal. We are completely dominated by our five senses and so the Bible says that you have the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in you bodily. And we go look in the mirror and we think, this is it? <laughs> and we see gray hairs and zits and ugly and 
And we think, God, I'm like you. No, it's not talking about your body and it's not talking about your mental part, but in... identical to Jesus. 1 John chapter 4 verse 17 says that herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, speaking of Jesus, so are we in this world. Not so are we going to be in the next world, so are we in this world. And see, some people again think, well, I'm not like Jesus because see, you're judging by the outward appearance. You know that your body is different and stuff, and your thoughts aren't right. But in the Spirit, you are a brand new creature, and you are identical to Jesus. He's, he made you as complete in the Spirit right the moment you got born again as you will ever be in eternity. Your Spirit's not going to be changed. Your Spirit's not going to have to be cleansed, purged from uh, iniquity or anything. Your Spirit right now is as pure and perfect as Jesus is, you have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2, 16. You know all things, 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. Your spirit's perfect. Your spirit's identical to Jesus. And the rest of the Christian life is learning how to rest in that and say, Father, you made me complete. And the doctor says you're going to die. All he can do is look at your physical body. He can't see your spirit. But in your spirit, you've got the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. It's not out there someplace that you've got to pray and pull it down. See, this is what so many religious people do. It's like, oh God, I believe that you can heal anything. I believe you can do anything. You have done nothing, but you could do it. And so I'm asking you to stretch forth your hand and come and touch this person. You see, you're, you're thinking that he still has to do something to produce healing. No, it was already done. And when you got born again, he put that raising from the dead power on the inside of you, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. It's not out there. It's in here. And the victory in the Christian life is learning how to rest in this and say, Father, I believe that when you made me, I am a new creation, a new creature, and I have everything and I am not going to doubt that. Most people believe when the doctor says you're sick, what they do is start moving towards healing. They look at it and say, healing's over here. And in the name of Jesus, I'm going to win a victory. Bernie and I were talking about that earlier, this song. You got to interpret it the right way. It's not wrong to say that we're going to see a victory. But the truth is, Jesus has already won it. And we aren't headed towards victory. We're coming from victory. But most people will say, here's healing over here, and I'm going to be healed. The moment you say that, you have said, I am not healed, but I'm going to be. And the moment you say that, you have enter, you've allowed the devil to enter in with doubt. Because, you know, if I said, I'm, I'm going to go from here to the back of this auditorium, you know, I've automatically made myself susceptible to there, somebody could... Uh, tackle me as I'm walking towards the back. Somebody could stand in my way and stop me. Something could happen. But if I say, no, I am here. I don't have to go anywhere. I'm here. How can I doubt that I'll get where I am? You can't stop me from getting here. I don't care what you do. I'm already here. But you can stop me from getting back there. See, once you understand that, no, by his stripes, I was healed. 1 Peter 2, 24, I've got supernatural, the same power that raised Christ from the dead dwelling in me. I keep pointing to my belly because the Bible said, Jesus said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the Spirit. So the Spirit, you know, is here in your belly. 
Some of us look like we got more of the Spirit than others. <laughs> Not so. So I've already got healing. I've got the power of God right here. And once I understand that, no, I'm already healed, then I fight not to get healed, but I fight to defend the healing that Jesus has already given me. See, that's resting in Him. Father, I'm, I don't have to do something to get you to heal me. By your stripes, I was healed. You put this power on the inside of me, and I'm just resting in the fact that it's a done deal. Now, that might lead somebody to thinking, well, so you just do nothing. You just sit back and count that everything's done. If you're still in Hebrews chapter 4, I quit with verse 10. Verse 11 says, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man spoil, fall after the same example of unbelief. You could take what I'm saying and say, well, then Jesus has done everything, so I'm just going to sit down and do nothing. Well... It is true that Jesus has done everything, but you have to labor to enter into that rest. It takes effort to renew your mind and to get to where you are not going to trust in yourself. I just prayed with a lady in between the services, and she uh, has a diagnosis of cancer, and she knows the Word of God, and she's strong in the Word of God, and she's believing God. But once that cancer diagnosis was given, she's had some panic come at her and some grief, and she's just been dealing with things. And basically what I was telling her is, you've got more than enough faith to be healed of cancer. It's not a problem, but it's these thoughts of unbelief, and you're going to have to labor to rest in what Jesus has done. And you're going to have to come against those thoughts. And this is where most people are missing the battle. I would suspect that the vast majority of people that go to Rez Life, you have heard the Word of God on healing. You believe it is God's will to heal, and you believe that God heals today. I've seen my wife and my son raised from the dead. My son was dead for five hours in a morgue, stripped naked, in a cooler. They'd already put him in one of the coolers, and they called me, and he just sat up and started talking. And today he's totally healthy and... Praise God. It's a miracle. Most of you in here believe that. And you believe that things like that can happen. But the difference is you don't rest. You don't trust. You don't rely upon the fact that it's done. You think that, God, I know you can do it. You don't doubt that what I'm saying is true. But what do I have to do to get it? You have to quit doing and start resting. And just thank you, Father, that it's done. But in order to rest like that, it takes a lot of effort. Yes, sir. It takes a lot of time in the Word to renew your mind and get to a place to where what God said is more real to you than what the doctor says, than what the banker says, than what the lawyer says, than what the news has to say. There is a lot of effort in resting. Man, that is a powerful statement right there. But you've got to labor to rest. You know, my oldest son, Joshua, when he was one year old, he was running and he fell and hit the corner of a table that was sharp like this and hit right here on his, on his ear. And when he did, this big old knot came up that was full of uh, stuff and it drained. And anyway, we just prayed over him and believed God for a healing. Did you know that every year for like 12 years, that knot came back on the exact same day every year? I think it was demonic. I can't see any reason why that would happen physically, naturally. But every year that thing would come back and we'd see that knot start coming back and we'd start praying. And after a few years of this, I was like, God, what's going on? I said, I have to rebuke this deal every year. What's... What's happening? And he told me, he says, you aren't resting in what I'm doing. You are fighting to get healed instead of fighting because he has been healed. Some of you may not see a difference in that, but there's a huge difference. And all of a sudden, I just said, he's healed. And instead of fasting and praying the way I had all of those previous years, we looked at it and we were, we were having a devotion as he was going to bed and we both started just laughing. 
saying, devil, you are so stupid. When are you going to quit and give up? By his stripes, you, we, he was healed, and we just forgot it and went on, and that's the last time it ever came up. There is a difference. There's a difference than saying, in the name of Jesus, I believe I'm healed. But you are fighting to get healed instead of fighting, defending what Jesus has already given you. You know, I was in the military, and in the military, if you took a, a hill, it was much easier to defend that, that high position than it was to go attack and overcome a hill. You get a defensive position to where you are defending what you already have instead of trying to go and get something you don't have. And you, it's just so much easier. This is what makes the Christian life so easy is when you just start resting in what God has done. And this lady that I prayed with in between the services, I basically just prayed with her primarily that you, she would just be able to overcome the fear, cast down those thoughts, stand there and fight against the unbelief. You don't need a lot of faith. Jesus said, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, it, that's tiny. You don't need big faith. It's not your faith that's the problem. It's your unbelief that's the problem. Because we aren't resting in what God has done. We are feeling the responsibility that, God, I've got to do something to make this happen. I'm telling you, this is powerful what I'm saying. I've, I've taken about two hours teaching and condensed it. And so uh, I've got a teaching on the Sabbath rest that would go into a lot more detail. I think I mentioned this in the first, first service, but if you go to our website, awmi.net, I've got 200,000 hours of free material there that you can watch or listen to. So uh, anyway, you can get it and it will be a blessing to you. If you haven't been resting in the Lord, if this has helped you today and you say, man, I ha I've been feeling like I've got to do something to make God move instead of just trusting what he's already done. And the reason I get in the word and labor is to change me not to change God, not to change God's attitude towards me, but to change my attitude towards God. If you haven't understood that, and if God has spoken to you today, and you know what, it's, you have to make a decision that I'm going to mix with faith what God has told me, then I want to pray with you today and just uh, help you to receive. I know that this could have quickened your faith because of the COVID things and, and time. We are, instead of having you come forward, I just want you, if God has quickened your faith and if you're ready to believe and start resting in what Jesus has already done, I want you to stand right where you are and I'm going to pray for you and we're going to believe God for a miracle. So you could be receiving a healing. You could be receiving prosperity. You could be receiving Jesus as your Lord and Savior. There may be some of you that are thinking, well, I'm coming to church. Will God save me now? It's not about going to church. You know, going to church is like parking a car in a garage. If you're a car, you ought to get into a garage for your own protection. If you're a Christian, you need to go to church. But going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than sitting in a garage would make you a car. You need to be born again. You need to just receive. Jesus died for your sins all you have to do is just receive it. So it, whether it's salvation, whether it's healing, prosperity, deliverance, whatever it is that you need, I want you today just to receive, as I pray, to receive the fact that God has already anticipated this. When you got born again, He put within you everything you'll ever need. It's already complete. It's just a matter of you resting in what God has already done. 
So Father, we love you and we thank you so much for Jesus. And thank you, Jesus, for everything you've done. Thank you for what you suffered. You suffered sickness so that I wouldn't have to be sick. You suffered the wrath of your Father so that I would never have to suffer it. Father, thank you that you've already placed all of your wrath upon Jesus. And I pray for my brothers and sisters here today, whatever it is, healing, salvation, deliverance, joy, peace, prosperity, anything. Father, we just now rest in the finished work of Jesus. And we believe, Father, that you are working miracles in people's lives right now. If people don't know you, I pray that right now they would just do what Romans 10, 9 says, confess with their mouth that Jesus is their Lord and believe in their heart that you raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. Father, I speak that over people right now. We thank you, Father, and we receive all of the benefits from what Jesus has already provided. We rest in that in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn it back over to Pastor Andrew, Dwayne. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, brother. Great word. Thank you may be seated. That was just a great word. Appreciate it very, very much. Hey, now, if you were one of the people who stood, and the reason that you stood was you were giving your life to the Lord, uh, we want you to contact us. If you would just text YES to 616-226-3922. We want to be praying for you.